Okay, everyone, time to start. So, today we're going to see Keplerian orbits. We'll solve in a different way the equation for the force model that we have, which is this one, of course. But um, I thought I would spend a few more words about the uh, numerical integration. So, you all have taken a numerical methods class, right? So, I assume that ground is covered. That's why I'm not going to do any specific integrators in this class. You are users of what is in MATLAB. ODE45 is probably what you're going to use. But uh, I was caught a little bit of off guard when I realized that no one had used ODE45 before. So, that's, that's, uh, that's on me. I'm sorry about that. So, I went a little too fast and I just want to show you why the function you have, the relative acceleration and the second one, why they are structured that way, uh, where that structure is coming from. Um, so this is the equation we have in Cartesian coordinates. Um, this differential equation is equivalent to x double dot equals minus uh, x squared, y squared, z squared, over squ under square root cube, the denominator, we have mu here, and this is x. And then you have a very similar equation for y double dot, this part is the same, and then you have y, z double dot, this part is the same, and then you have z. Okay? So these are the three equations that we're trying to integrate, uh, second order differential equations. And uh, the way the function that I give you is structured is rewriting these equations using state space representation, which you guys told me I've seen before somewhere. But let's basically refresh very quick what it is that you do when you have differential equations and uh, you want to rewrite them this way. Basically, you want to write that system in a way where your highest time derivative is of order one. So this capital X is, yes? Sorry, I'm a question. When you have that square root with a three, is that a square root being cubed or is that a cubed root? No, a cubed root will be this. So this is a square root first, which is r. So this is r, and then r is cubed, right? Just making sure the notation. Thank you. Yeah, is that the notation you use for squares, right? Square for roots. The number will go here. If you don't have anything, it's a two. Okay. So um, state space space representation. You want this vector of variables, whatever they are, uh, to only show first time derivatives, and then the rest is a function of x on the right hand side for a linear system. Um, what you've seen is probably this form, x dot equals a matrix times x, where if the matrix is constant, this is a linear time invariant system, otherwise it's a linear time varying system. In this case, it's a non-linear system. This, these equations are obviously non-linear in x, y, and z. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, what we have. So how do I rewrite a system like this so that I only see uh, time derivative of first order where you, you, you make a change of variable. So uh, for example, you say that a new variable x1 is x, a new variable x2 is y, a new variable x3 is z, x4 is x dot, x5 is y dot, and x6 is z dot. So you redefine new variables and you go all the way to the derivative which is right before the highest you see in your differential equations and this is my new vector x, state vector x, right? Bless you. This is what I call x. And so once I have this substitution, my x dot, which is what that function relative acceleration is creating. So this is basically what I think I call dy. For some reason I call it dy. You can call it whatever you want. That's the output of the function rel acceleration. It's spitting out x dot. What is this going to be? Well, x dot is x1 dot, but x1 dot is x dot. So this is x4, and then you have x5, and then you have x6, and then you have x4 dot, but x4 dot is x double dot. So you would have minus, mu, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera x, which is x1, and then for x5 dot, you would have minus mu, etc., etc., x2, and minus mu, etc., etc., x3. 
this is how my function is structured. If you look at the last instruction in that short rel acceleration.m file, well, these are called u's. But basically, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are the inputs. It's a six component vector that comes in as an input. And with that vector, you are assembling the output, which is x dot or dy. I just called it dy. So that's how. That's how uh, you transform a system of differential equations. Doesn't matter how high is the derivative. It doesn't matter if it's no linear or linear. You just do a substitution of variables so that you can basically rewrite it in this form. And uh, that is the form you put in your equation that would be integrated by ODE45 or something else. Because if you integrate this vector, of course, you get, uh, well, is this vector dot, you get positions and velocities, which is what we done last time. Does it make sense? So that is the syntax that ODE45 understands. And all the integrators, they basically work that way. They want you to create a function that spits out a, uh, the derivatives that you want to integrate having used state space representation. So that's, that's really what's behind that function. I just thought I would uh, spend a few more words on this. Any questions? So play with that, uh, with those functions I gave you, because we'll do a lot with MATLAB, or at least a little bit of work with MATLAB. So now integrating in time that equation is not the only way of visualizing it as we've done it. Today we're going to see how that differential equation can be solved in a parametric way where time is not the independent variable, it's something else. Uh, and today I'm going to use vectors a lot, so I'm going to rely on my notes here so that we don't waste too much time. First of all, we start from this. Angular momentum of the gravitational force. Well, it's not really of the gravitational force. Let me rephrase this. Of what I'm actually doing is the angular momentum of, what did we call it, m2 with respect to m1. That's really what I'm going to do first. So what is that? By definition, we've seen this. m1 is the attracting body. So it's the point with respect to which I'm computing h, seen by the inertial observer. This is going to be r2 minus r1 cross with m2 velocity of m2 with respect to the inertial observer minus velocity of m1 with respect to the inertial observer. Recall that we said at some point I'm going to have some coordinate system fixed in an inertial frame and I have two masses, m1 which is usually the planet and m2 whose positions are given by big R1 and big R2 and uh, what I'm really going to care about is what this little r vector does. It's the relative motion between the two. And we said that if we center a coordinate system at m1 and the axis of that coordinate system don't change orientation, uh, we can do the following. We can say that this is really the same as saying r cross with m2 r dot. So from now on, uh, remember last time I said the dot indicates derivatives with respect to the inertial observer, because I don't want to carry that DDT in N all the time. And so R dot is equivalent for us to saying V, with the understanding that V is the velocity of M2 with respect to M1. I'm sitting on M1 and I'm looking at M2, my satellite. Uh, the, uh, so that's, that's what it is. What we're going to use is the following, though, is H per unit mass. So I'll call it with a little h. And let me simplify even more here from now on. Otherwise, it will take me forever to write equations. From now on, this is just h, OK? With the understanding that h is the angular momentum of per unit mass of mass 2 computed with respect to the position of m1, the center of the planet, seen by the inertial observer. So what this is is simply r cross with our dot. That's, that's what it is. OK, um, what happens to that little h? What is h dot? 
Now this is an astrodynamics class, and anything that has a dynamics, uh, it involves taking vectors and computing rates of change. That's all we do. It's r dot cross with r dot, right? Plus r cross with r double dot. Now this is obviously a zero vector, and this is r cross with minus mu over r cubed r, because that's the model I'm using for the force between the two, right? And so that's zero as well. This is, except this scalar part here, this is r cross with r, so this is going to give me zero. So the first important result here is that h is constant. The angular momentum is constant. Now what is h? h is the cross product of the position vector that goes from m1 to m2 and the velocity of m2 r dot or call it v whatever you want to call it. And so the cross product of these two is a vector h and it doesn't change with respect to the inertial observer. What does that tell me? What have we seen last time? We integrated that equation over and over again the relative acceleration dot m function, so without j2, that trajectory was always the same, right? So, what is this telling me? Is h perpendicular to some plane? Yeah, the plane that contains position and velocity, right? That's how it's defined, it's a cross product. So that plane doesn't change, because it's normal doesn't change, right? So this implies that the uh, relative trajectory lies in a plane. The plane doesn't change. If you use that simple model for the gravitational force, M2 goes around M1 and the plane in which this happens does not change in the inertial frame remains constant. That's exactly what we've seen when we integrated the function uh, rel acceleration dot m last time. Okay, that's an important result. And uh, if you go back to what we've done integrating th that equation um, numerically, I said I needed six constants of integration, six initial conditions, because it's a second order differential equation with three components. So I need six, initial position and, is and initial velocity, right? Well, there's another way to look at the constants of integration. Anything that is a constant for that motion, you can kind of use it uh, actually as an initial condition. So this could be one. Actually, this could be three, because this is a vector. H is a vector. So it has three components. It can take you know, the place of x uh, zero, y zero, z zero, x dot zero, y dot zero, z dot zero, three of those. So this could be three of my constants of integration, but that's uh, you know something will it's, it's, it's telling us uh, uh, something very important, which is you don't change plane. So you can actually use that plane as a coordinate plane, as we will do heavily. So that's the first result, and uh, we'll keep it there. Now, uh, one thing that I want to do, so this is really creating the environment so that we can start talking about different shapes of orbits next time. Uh, the velocity, or r dot, we can always decompose it into a radial component, right? And a tangential component or normal component. So M1, M2, whatever its its velocity at a given time, I'm going to decompose it into V perpendicular and uh, V radial. I can do that, right? Now, if that's what I do, what happens to h uh, from this? Well, h is r cross with v, or r dot, it's the same thing. So you see that the uh, parallel component doesn't contribute, so you're really le left with r v perpendicular along the unit vector of h. If you want, I can just write h over its norm. Do you agree? So this angular momentum vector is extremely important. We're going to do a lot with this, using the fact that it doesn't change. So 
So I know so far that h is a constant vector. Okay? And that tells me that its norm, so just h, is the position of the spacecraft multiplied times its normal velocity at all times. So it doesn't matter where you are on the orbit, that's always true. So why am I bothering doing this? Have you ever heard of Kepler's laws? No, Kepler was Keplero, Keplero, as I would call it. He was a very smart guy and he was looking at planets going around the sun and he came up with three laws uh, that we can actually prove with starting from uh, mu over r cubed times r. So we can't really call them laws anymore. I can prove them. Uh, let's prove one of them, which is, I think, the second one. Um, it tells you that the, uh, the radius little r as m2 moves around m1, is going to sweep equal areas in equal times, right? If you have ever heard of this. So, um, let's prove that. m1, this is a must for an astrodynamics class, Kepler's laws. m2, this would be my uh, position at some time t, right? r at some time t. And then after an infinitesimal time dt, I am at a new position, t, function of t plus dt. And uh, the vector that creates this change in r is v times dt. Right? And so I want to compute this area here that the position vector has covered, dA. Okay. So today is a lot of information about orbits that you just have to digest and accept. Well, I'll prove most of the things, but we, we need all these things. Uh, okay, um, how do you compute this area here? It's a triangle, right? What do you do? Base, 1 over 2, base times height. Let's use this as the base, that would be r. What is this? It's v perpendicular dt, okay? Uh, does it look familiar? This is h. So this is 1 over 2 h dt, norm of h. And so this allows me to tell you that the rate of change of the area with respect to time is 1 over 2 h. A is a scalar. I can take the rate of change without telling you who is the observer. And so this is Kepler's second law. The uh, rate of change of the area is constant. The area that is covered by the position vector. H is a constant. Its norm is a constant. H over 2 is a constant. dA dt is constant. So where you are in areas where of the trajectory in an elliptical orbit like the one we've seen uh, in integration uh, in MATLAB, when you are close to M1, that vector still has to describe the same area in the same amount of time, so probably the satellite is moving a little faster than when you are far away. Do we see that? Let me, uh, let me I'm terrible at drawing usually, but maybe this will make some sense. So if uh, M1 is here, and you're moving in this area, and you have a short vector r, you need, in the same amount of time, delta t, you need to sweep the same area that you would uh, sweep here, far away, where your distance is higher. So probably you need, uh, need to move less on the arc here to have the same area. So here you're moving faster, here you're moving slower. We'll prove it with equations, but that's, uh, that's what he was measuring with these observations, and he came up with this law that we have just proven. Okay, so that's one of them. Now let's, let's solve that. Let's solve that equation and find the parametric expression for the uh, Keplerian orbits. Can I erase all this? Maybe I'll start here. Do you have any questions? Anything not clear so far? No? Okay. Yes? So, say you're accelerating all the way through the points, you're accelerating, 
you're always accelerating, you're always accelerating with this. This is your acceleration. What changes is r, depending on your distance, you have a different acceleration. Yep. It's a function of r, and as r can change, as we'll see in a second, uh, the acceleration will also change. All right, so I want to solve this in a parametric way. So we'll solve it What does this mean? Does this make sense? Parametrically? Parame uh, something like that. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. That means that I'm not going to solve it as a function of time. I'll just come up with something else that is not time to solve it. Okay. Now, this is a lot of vectors um, calculation. The first thing uh, is, is one, one tool that I'm going to use is the following. If I have a vector r and I dot it with itself, of course I get r squared, right? Scalar. If I take the rate of change of both sides, uh, on this side I get 2r dotted with dr in dt, respect to n. Uh, on this side I get 2r r dot. This is scalars, this is uh, vectors. So that implies that r vector dotted with r dot vector is the same as r dotted, uh, not dotted, multiply times r dot. So this is just something that is valid for any vector, right? I'm going to use this. So I'll just write it up here. So this is my starting point. I'm going to use this property at some point and other properties, and as I use them, I'll just give them to you. Properties of vectors, nothing else. So, starting, is this clear, what I've done here? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can write it again. 2 r dotted with d n dt of r is equal to 2 r r dot, which leads to this. We agree that d dt in n is, you just write vector with a dot. So that's, that's the same expression. I simplify the two. That's, that's what I get. Let me move here. Uh, so I'm going to take that equation and cross it with h. In other words, I'm going to do the following. r dot cross with h is going to be equal to minus mu r cubed r cross with h. I can do this, right? That's an equality. That's my model for the gravitational force. I take both sides and I do whatever I want as long as I do it on both sides. It's still an equality, right? So uh, let's, uh, let's look at 1 and 2 separately and, and see what we can get. So for 1, I observe this. Let me see what I wrote down here. If you take the rate of change of the following cross product, r dot cross with h, you should get that actually. Now, the reason why sometimes you still see me writing d dt with respect to n is that when I do it on a single vector, like in this case, I can just say, okay, we agree that I'm just going to put the dot on top of the vector and that's okay. But when I do it on, on a cross product or something like that, I can't just put a dot on top of the whole thing. I think it will look terrible. So uh, I'll just use it when needed. Okay. So what is this? This is r double dot cross with h, what I have there, plus r dot cross with h dot. Can you tell me something about this? No? Guys, if I'm losing anyone along the way, you should stop me. Yes? Is h constant there? Yeah, h is constant, so that's a good point. So this is zero. So that's, that's the, the left-hand side. I can, uh, for now, I'll just keep it like this. This is equivalent to doing this. Let's keep it there. Two, that thing over there, uh, uh, what I'm going to focus on is just 1 over r cubed, r cross with h, which is equivalent to 1 over r cubed, r cross with h is nothing else than r cross with r dot, or v, r dot, v is the same thing, right? Velocity. Now, this is where I'm going to use a property of vectors that is in chapter one of your book, and uh, we use it 
all over the place and the moment you use it you usually forget it and that's okay that's why I have notes these can be this double cross product can also be expressed the following way this is also called the um, it's this property a cross with b cross with c is equal to a let's see yeah back this is a way to remember the back cab rule or something like that so basically you have vector 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 the dot is here vector 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 the dot is here so that's that's what I've used I'm sure you've seen it before double cross product okay let's uh, do something else with this uh, what can I do this then I use that property over there, number two. That's why I have it. Otherwise, I'm just wasting my time. Uh, one over r cubed, r vector, that becomes scalars, r, r dot. And then I have r dot, yes. Well, r dotted with r is r squared, right? So I can simplify one r, and I get one over r squared, r, r dot, one is a vector, one is a scalar, minus r dot r, okay, I don't have enough space here, that ugly expression can actually come out of doing another derivative, if I take the rate of change in n of this ratio, I get something similar. Let's prove it. Uh, numerator dot denominator minus denominator dot numerator over denominator squared. Does it look similar? Let's see. I'm missing a vector here. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, forgot the underline. That makes a huge difference. Let's see if uh, we recognize terms. The r squared the denominator is there. The r that is multiplying r dot is there. r is a vector, r dot is a scalar. r dot is a vector, r is a scalar. So that is the expression except the minus. So in other words, the right hand side of that top equation, number two there, minus mu over r cubed r cross with h, after all this pain, can be written as uh, minus
Oh. That's better. We're back? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. Are you recording? Yeah. Okay. Also, it might be good to repeat the questions they asked, because I don't know if Yeah. Good. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is my position vector, and this this e is just a vector again that doesn't change. So e and h are fixed. Once you give me a position and velocity for the the satellite with respect to the planet, uh, they don't change. They're fixed. So you can compute them at initial time. They will remain the same. And so I'm calling, since I know that these two will sit in the same plane all the time, I'm just calling theta the angle between the two. Right? I can do that. Okay. And now, on this side, you're going to believe me that this dot product combined with the cross product is equivalent to doing, this is another vector property that it's in your books somewhere, um, it's equivalent to doing this. Okay, that's what I have. So this can be swapped and it becomes R cross with R dot cross dotted with H. And this is H. So this is H squared. That's all. So this whole expression becomes H squared, the norm of H over U. And finally, I can collect R and give you the expression for Keplerian orbits. So I will solve for r here. r is equal to h squared over mu 1 plus e cos... Uh, I'm sorry. There is a, a 1, 1 over 1 plus e cosine of theta. This is what defines what we call Keplerian orbits. See, what I've done with all this uh, dotting and crossing all over the place, I have located the plane where the orbit is evolving. Once you compute your h, you're locking the plane in place. It doesn't change. Once you compute the e, you're also locking a direction in that plane that doesn't change. right? And once I define theta, I basically am able to tell you, if I know what theta is, where m2 is. Do we see that? You are in space, you lock a plane. On this plane, m1 and m2 are always sitting. It's not going to change plane. I lock a direction, which is e, in place. And all I'm left with to tell you what the satellite is, is an angle that individuates r and its magnitude, and this is the magnitude of r. Yes? Is that say cosine theta in the box? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a parametric expression for your orbit. Now, uh, why is this parametric? Because theta is my parameter, it's not time. I haven't chosen time here, right? So we'll put time back into the picture with chapter 3. We're not going to do it for a while. Uh, you have done it integrating the differential equations last time, but yes. Yeah. Is it the denominator? Is it 1 plus e cosine theta? Mm-hmm. The e looks like a c. Better? Better. You know what? I'll write it again. <laughs> 1 over 1 plus e cosine of theta. Yes. Now, a few observations about this. Um, any other questions? Uh, so that plane that you have on board, that's, that's the plane of the orbit? Yes. That we can call it orbital plane from now on. It's not going to change. So go back to your... Uh, one good exercise. You go back to your code. Now you can plot the same red line that I did plot last time with ODE45, you can do it in a completely different way. You can compute your h as, for example, position at time 0 crossed with the velocity at time 0, because we know this is constant. So you can compute at any position and corresponding velocity. It's not going to change. So you do it at initial time, and that's your h. So that will give you the plane. 
compute a the e vector as you know it's defined r over r I'm not going to rewrite that expression it's the plus vector over mu and then instead of time you can have an angle theta that goes you know from 0 to 2 pi and plot this uh, in that plane Sorry, yes can you actually write down the expression for e again i did i raise it Well, E is R dot cross with H over mu minus R over R. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I did. May have missed it. Yes. That's your eccentricity vector is uh, C over mu. Uh, so the same, same goes here. Once you have H, which is computed once and for all, you can stick in uh, r at time zero, d zero, this is v zero position. This is also constant, so you compute it once and for all. So you have some kind of coordinate system, right? You have the h direction, the e direction. All you need to know is change theta and define a vector at each time step that is at an angle theta with e and has this magnitude that is given by this expression. Now e, e itself, of course, it's the norm of the vector e. And we'll, of course, this is a normal vector, so it cannot be negative, right? It will be always greater than zero or equal to zero. We're not going to do it uh, today, but uh, you know, if it's zero, we'll see this is a circular orbit. It's that's easy to see. Just put a zero here. R is always constant; doesn't change. So that theta will change, but R remains the same, same distance from the planet. Uh, between 0 excluded and 1 excluded, you get elliptical, exactly what we had last time. So try to compute your E vector from that problem we solved the last time in MATLAB. Again, compute H and E at initial time, extract the norm of E, you should get something between 0 and 1. If that orbit is closed and it's not circular, that's uh, what you should get. Then if you have E equal to 1, you get parabolic trajectories. I thought I was going to finish this today, but not. doesn't look like. And E greater than 1, you get hyperbolic trajectories. That is, in the end, this calculation that we've done, this is proving Kepler's first law. The one that tells you that the trajectories are, um, again, he was looking at planets and the sun. You know, the same kind of laws apply here between a planet and a spacecraft. He stated that those orbits are elliptical. And uh, the focus of the, uh, one of the focuses is the planet. Well, this, plotted yourself, is the equation changing E from 0 to, uh, to greater than 1, is the equation of conic, conic sections. Um, well, I'll leave you with this. Just give me a minute. At least this wraps up on Keplerian orbits. What are conic sections? You get two symmetric cones, circular cones, axis of symmetry. If you start cutting with a plane these cones and you do it with a plane normal to the axis of symmetry, you get a circle. If you incline the plane, you get elliptical uh, lines. If you incline even more, you become parallel to one of the sides here you get parabolic trajectories. If you go parallel to the axis of symmetry, you get two branches and you get hyperbolic trajectories. So Kepler stated that those were conic sections, what the planets were describing around the sun, and try to plot these changing E, you do get circle, ellipses, uh, parab parabolas, and uh, hyperbolic trajectories. We'll do more next time.